nearly as many slides as Joe, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm going to talk about the situation in the world today, especially with regard to the situation in the hacker world and the things that relate to our community. Um, I could talk about that for an hour, no problem, but uh, uh, it would be very dry and it would also be, given the state of the world as it is, it would be very depressing. Um, so I'll lighten it up a bit and tell you a little bit about me, and the things I've done and some of the things that have happened. Um, and then we'll get to the depressing stuff later. <laughs> um, they say hackers aren't made, they're born. Uh, I'm not sure that's true completely in all cases. But it appears to be true in my case. Uh, in Amsterdam, we have these things. This is a street organ. I just took the first picture that came up on Google Images. But these are street organs. And, and if you look closely to the right, you see the stacks of books. And that's where they play their music from, with the little holes. Um, my mother remembers clearly that as a three-year-old, a two- or three-year-old, uh, all the other kids would always stand in awe in front of the thing and watch the, the things move and, and, and the little. And, and she always had to hold me up at the back of the thing so I could see how it worked. Um, then at age 11, I built a radio transmitter uh, so we could play cassette music and talk on the radio uh, and the entire village could hear us on uh, a number of different frequencies all over the FM band, continuously differing frequencies, uh, somewhere between the police and the air band, if we were lucky. Um, mostly depending on the temperature of the transmitter, but we had fun. Um, then as a teenager in high school, uh, I read the book Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution by an American author named Stephen Levi. Um, and in that book, he describes the early hackers at MIT uh, and in the Bay Area. Uh, it was about people building and programming the first computers. And it was about people making computers accessible to the public, the first home computers. Um, no, no, it's okay. I turned it off. I didn't. <laughs> Otherwise, I, I talk and all these people keep looking at the street organ all the time. It's like everybody uh, mesmerized by the street organ. Um, and there was even people in the Bay Area uh, in the 70s setting up a network of public terminals for people to use so they could use a system very much like Craigslist today to pu post public messages and read other people's messages. Um, and reading that book made me realize that's what I was. I was a hacker. This is what I was called. Um, I became familiar with the Chaos Computer Club from Germany with 2600, the hacker magazine. Most of you probably know. Um, my own country didn't have a hacker culture as such. It had a few uh, people interested in technology, some of, them, some of them my friends, but it didn't have a hacker culture. Uh, but there was other inspiration. During the 1980s, the Netherlands did have a very active squatter movement. Uh, radical anarchists, but with, with sort of a, a twist. Um, there's a famous magazine called Bluff, and Bluff had a, a, a really crazy articles. It showed how to tilt Amsterdam gas meters. So if you just tilted them 90 degrees, they, had, they were in flexible hoses, uh, they would count less or, or no gas. So you could be in a house. Amsterdam is very cold, so you need lots of gas to heat your houses. Um, how to break into places that you wanted to squat. There was articles about lock picking, but it was all very, with a very big sense of humor. They even had articles by groups that were breaking into secret government bunkers to steal documents to get the plans for World War III and what they were going to do to the population and which people they were going to, they were going to intern uh, as soon as, as, as things started to go sour. Uh, and these plans were then published in this magazine. So uh, I was at that time. Uh, a 13 or 14 year old, I was stuck in a village, uh, way too properly brought up to be part of that scene. But I really enjoyed the humor. I enjoyed that these people were, were not just uh, uh, radical anarchists, uh, uh, sort, of, sort of believing a cause and following it blindly, but they were also having truckloads of fun. Uh, so there was inspiration in Holland, for sure, um, as much as there was inspiration in the Chaos Computer Club in 2600. Um, in 1988, I went to the CCC Congress in Hamburg, which happens every year between Christmas and New Year. I highly recommend going there if you've never been. It's a really cool conference. Uh, and that's the first time I met a few hundred other people that were also hackers. A very, very, very intense two weeks. Uh, I learned German in two weeks. Uh, um, and that 
that's when I was already planning to do a hacker magazine, but that's when we really started finishing up the articles. And uh, end of January, so only a month later, we, we published the first issue of Hacktick, the magazine. This is what it looked like. You can see our mascot hunting neckties. Um, that summer was also the summer of the Galactic Hacker Party, which was probably the first truly international hacker meeting. It had Americans, it had Germans, it had Dutch people, uh, people from pretty much everywhere in the world. There was Australians. Uh, we're coming to Amsterdam to meet. Um, in the first issue of Hacktic, we wrote about the dangers to privacy from increased linking of databases, uh, as well as the great new possibilities that computer networks would offer in the future. It's like in 1989, this was like a really crazy story. We, we told people, you will all be online and, and you'll be exchanging messages. The fax machine isn't the most high-tech thing the world can do with modems, and, and, uh, which was a really radical and, and slightly crazy message at the time. People that know me from that time remember that I was always rambling about this thing called the internet. And uh, many people thought there was a screw loose or something, that, a, that something was wrong with me. Uh, um, but Hacktick from the start, I mean, it's called a techno-anarchist magazine. Uh, from the start, it was as much a political magazine as it was a technical magazine. And it wasn't only about computer security. Um, what we did pay a lot of attention to was the telephone system. Uh, we, had, uh, we were the last generation of hackers to grow up in a time when international telephone calls were really, really expensive and the internet didn't exist yet. So we paid uh, 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 the equivalent of 10 US dollars or more per minute to call to the US. Uh, so international communications were still very, very expensive. Uh, of course, there were ways you could trick the international phone system. You could dial a free telephone number abroad and then convince the other exchange that the call had ended, uh, but do it so short that the other exchange didn't have time to tell my exchange to hang up on me. So my exchange would still think the call was in progress, and then you could, with a system of tones, you could tell the other exchange to dial uh, anywhere. So you could dial a free number to a hotel in France, uh, and then tell the French exchange to connect you to America, and, and there would be no billing. Um, during that time, uh, uh, we used that a lot. We had a, a spare line, and uh, uh, Sometimes uh, our favorite radio station uh, uh, was WUSB, and WUSB unfortunately was an FM station in New York, so we couldn't get it. So usually we turned on the radio by dialing the WUSB listen line in New York, and then leaving that on sometimes for a week, just just on the radio. Uh, that was fun. Uh, the girl that I was with, who is now my wife and the mother of my children, Carla. Uh, used that to call her brother on the ship that he was at, uh, on the Inmarsat, uh, which was really funny because they were, uh, uh, she was, uh, uh, at some point, they were playing chess uh, over the Inmarsat. And the Inmarsat, uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you were on a ship at that time, if the Inmarsat rang, uh, you ran to get a pencil if you had to write something down. Nobody would ever, it's like total stress if the, if the phone was on because that was like 20, 30, uh, dollars a minute. Um, so that was fun. Um, we also made phone calls from one side of the desk to the other, from one phone over a lot of international stations, sometimes looping around the world three or four times and then calling the other phone. So you could say hello and then walk to the other phone, pick it up and hear yourself say hello. Um, uh, I was in, with Carla, I was in, in Russia in, uh, in 90 uh, uh, during the coup against Gorbachev. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but there was a, there was a military coup in, in the Soviet Union uh, or in Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, this military coup uh, happened when we had just returned to Moscow. Uh, so we were woken up by friends, like there's something bad happening. We went to the, the Red Square, uh, Manege Square, and to the, uh, to the center of town. Um, and, uh, but before we left, uh, I got a call from Bill uh, a friend of mine who lived in my apartment in Amsterdam, uh, and uh, uh, Bill said that CNN was reporting that all the phone lines were cut and that indeed they were all cut, but he had found a switchboard in Lithuania that would still allow him to make calls into, into uh, Russia. Uh, so he had found a way around the, the, the blocking of all the phone lines. Uh, 
And later that day, he would be connecting all of the world's media to whoever they wanted to call in the Soviet Union. So he was connecting BBC World, CNN, and God knows who to people in the Soviet Union. Um, another fun thing we, do, we did was, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember pagers. Uh, many people don't. But pagers were fun. Uh, you could send text messages or sometimes only numeric messages to receivers uh, uh, that people carried. Um, and of course, all of this was unencrypted in the air. So you could receive the, the, the radio code for a pager and then the message that was going to it, uh, which was really fun if, if, uh, for a group of hackers that was having a party late at night. Uh, you would see these phone numbers come by, and you would call them, and you'd say, yes, you paged. Uh, and then they'd say, uh, yeah, but I paged Richard. Yeah, Richard's gone for a moment. He gave me his pager. Uh, so what's up? Oh, I don't know. But, but where's Richard? Uh, yeah, he's, he's with this girl, but he gave me his pager. said, if anybody wanted, what do you mean he's with this girl? <laughs> um, uh, you could do really funny tricks by, by uh, answering people's pages. This is, I mean, we're, we were all early 20s. This was a late night party. And, uh, I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't recommend doing this. And it's, it's uh, anyway, we had, we had lots of fun. We, uh, there was lots of, uh, 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 people expecting uh, expecting shipments of drugs that we then sent around to other places. Uh, uh, like there's one person that really wants drugs, and uh, uh, there's other people that want repairs done. Uh, I have this broken machine, so we would send uh, 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 we would send uh, uh, people that wanted drugs to pretend they were repair people because my friend he has something, but he's 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 working in this industrial company and he's. he's uh, but he has something, he can give it to you, but you have to pretend that you're a repair person, otherwise the, the doorman won't let you in. So we'd send, we'd send drug people to, to do industrial repairs and stuff. Good fun. Um, there was a funny episode in, uh, in, in the history of Hacktic where uh, we had three or four phone lines. One of them was doing the early access for all mail exchange, the UUCP mail exchange. Um, and one of these phone lines uh, uh, at some point developed a problem. First, we thought the modem was broken because the modem picked up and it went beep. And uh, we thought, well, this modem's broken. Uh, so we replaced the modem and it still it was giving this cra crazy we uh, weeping sound even before it started dialing. And then we figured out that it was on the phone line. We had a, a bud set, a test set. We listened to the phone line and it, it, it had this, this noise on it, the 3,000 hertz beep as we later determined a perfect 3,000 hertz sine wave that was even there when the phone line was on the hook. Um, so I called the phone company uh, while Bill was still sort of looking at the scope and then listening to it, and I called the phone company. And as I called the phone company, Bill's face just went through all kinds of colors, and he looked at me like, hang up, hang up, hang up. And we discovered that when I picked up another phone line, we'd actually hear the voice, the, the, the sounds from that phone line on this, on this broken phone line, but inverted. The 3,000 hertz beep went away, and we heard ourselves inverted. So we figured, that's strange. That's probably very typical. This was, we discovered that they had hooked up a device to tap us wrong. This device normally has a line that they intercept, they hook up to, to the input, and then the output is sent to, the, to wherever they record the calls, but the output is scrambled a technique where you invert a voice with a 3,000 hertz tone, so, so it's, you can't, you can't make, uh, make up what's happening, at least not with casual interception. Uh, so we had actually, they had given us one line that they were tapping, but then they hooked up the output to another line they were tapping from us, but it was a wrong hookup. Uh, so then I called uh, uh, the phone switch, uh, because we were social engineering the phone company, so I called up the phone switch, uh, with a very, very flat Amsterdam accent uh, and said, uh, uh, this is John, I'm, I'm with repairs. Uh, 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 I have a problem here with line so-and-so, could you check? And I knew all the, all the right numbers that went with my line, the, uh, the CO numbers that went with my line. Uh, so he went to check and he came back and said, oh, that's funny. There's an extra wire on it. Oh, well, hang on, wait a second. Uh, oh, wait, wait. And then he said, he paused for a while and said, is the customer with you? I said, no, he's gone. I'm, I'm, he's left me alone here. I said, okay, uh, it's going into this special room, you know, right to, to the right of the door. I said, uh huh. So, and I said, so what do we do now? Uh, he said, I don't know. They probably did something wrong. Uh, shall I just unhook the wires? I said, yeah, that's probably good. Um, 
So then uh, I tried to think later, uh, what, because this line that we were doing this on was also on tap. Uh, and I, rem I, 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 just, I just imagine these people sitting there going, no! <laughs> That's funny. Um, another interesting thing where we noticed that the uh, uh, intelligence community was taking an interest in us uh, uh, was when, uh, uh, this goes with a picture. Um, hang on. Uh, this is the picture. Um, the red arrow indicates the office where, where Access for All was located. I'll come to that later. That was our offices. And as you can see, opposite the street, there's a, a, a military facility, which is nicely pixeled out in Google Earth if you go there. Um, and this military facility had, uh, uh, was handling all the signals intelligence for the Netherlands. Uh, and with Access for All, we had a bunch of phone lines. And uh, uh, I'll come to the Access for All story later, but we had a whole bunch of phone lines. And uh, at one point, we ordered uh, 20 extra lines. And for that, they, uh, they brought an, uh, a 100 pair cable into our building. So they hooked us up to a street cable that had 100 pairs. Uh, however, they hooked us up to the wrong street cable. They hooked us up to a street cable going there. And this was at a time when all of Amsterdam was a complete mess and the phone company didn't know, one hand didn't know what the other hand was doing. And the growth of networks was such that, that the older structures of the phone companies weren't keeping up. This is, this is the early 90s, 93, 94. Um, so they hooked us up to the wrong cable, disconnecting uh, uh, the SIGINT feeds from the receiving stations at the coast uh, to this, this place over there. We never knew because we weren't even in that building yet. Uh, uh, because all we, all we did was move our lines there. Uh, we had two 19-inch racks in a building that was still being renovated uh, because we couldn't quit our move because the, the, the renovation was late. So this was uh, a hippie sleeping uh, in a sleeping bag on a mattress because there was no locks on the doors next to two 19-inch racks full of equipment where your SIGINT lines have just been terminated. And this is a bunch of hackers. Um, what are they going to think? Um, when the phone company, we later heard this story sort of, sort of through, through various means, uh, when the phone company went to explain to these people what had happened, uh, already being summoned on, an, on a matter of state security and God knows what, uh, uh, they explained that uh, uh, there had been a mistake by the street people and their lines had been terminated at Hacktick Network. Um, and. Uh, uh, Apparently, the, uh, the, tele the, the, uh, uh, the telecom uh, person was almost dragged across the table uh, by somebody shouting, uh, that's not a mistake, they're just making you think it's a mistake. <laughs> um, we never noticed any of this at the time, except that, that there was uh, uh, digging, uh, telephone company digging, um, because all the cables are underground, um, at, uh, uh, at three o'clock in the morning. And these people were digging like their lives depended on it, which they probably did. Um, the hectic time was, was a relatively crazy time. There, were, there, was, uh, 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 there was no laws against hacking until 93. So there was people uh, uh, at parties breaking into uh, US military systems just for the hack of it, just because they could. Uh, uh, not, to, not to damage anything, but just to show, uh, to show off the, 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 the nice FBI warnings about all the bad things that would happen to you. Of course, laughing about them because hacking was not a crime in any way in Holland. Um, uh, sort of taunting uh, 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 the authorities by showing that that, uh, that that could still be done. Um, but as you remember, in 1989, we also wrote about citizens setting up their own networks, about people forming networks. Um, we had our own internet provider back in 1991 because all the universities have had internet. Uh, and we had broken into plenty of university accounts. We had, a, we had an informal internet provider going where we were providing expats and, and press people with broken accounts uh, so they could see this internet thing that we were always talking about. And, and, and some people at the university were letting us use their accounts. So we, our internet access was fine. But in 93, the computer crime legislation came in. And we knew that, that we were on the shit list. We were going to get busted no matter what. So 
not only did we feel that it was really good to be setting up citizen networks, but in 93, we also needed to secure our own internet access, which was a major reason for starting Access for All. Access for All, at one point, was just the name of a machine uh, ran by Hactic Network. As you can see, it's slightly opened. Um, and this machine was, was the first machine that was not just doing mail and news transfer over the UUCP network, but it was also connected over IP using a 19.2 slip line to, uh, to the university building or to a building where the internet was, NLNet it was called. Um, Access for All was, was, as it grew, because it was first called Hactic Network, but then later the name changed to Access for All. And Access for All was a, was a very, it, it grew into being a, a, a large provider, into a large business, but it was really uh, started off as, as more of a political statement and an attempt at sharing the cost of that internet line, which was very expensive. We started on May 1st, 93, and we needed 500 people to share the cost with. And we had given ourselves till December of 93 to, to find these 500 people. And then we had lots of media coverage uh, uh, on May 1st, and we logged uh, a customer number 500 on May 2nd, uh, knowing that we had a problem, but of a different kind than we thought we had. Um, it was a very, a time of really crazy, crazy growth. I'm not sure all of you can imagine what it's like if you've never ran a company and uh, uh, your customer base is growing at 10 or 15 percent per month or more. Um, we had uh, 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 people calling friends to come in and please help because we need somebody to, ma to administer this or to put up modems or to hook up cables or crimp something or do something. Um, and uh, our hiring policy consisted of uh, 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 offering a job to people that had obviously been there for weeks or months, uh, uh, were obviously doing something useful, uh, giving them a few hundred euros uh, or guilders back then um, to uh, go to the store and get themselves a second-hand desk and, ch and chair uh, so they could make themselves a decent workplace uh, in this really old decrepit building that we were in. Um, we had crazy policies like uh, uh, new employees were asked long after Access for All was, was a serious company. We asked new employees to either learn how to juggle with three balls or to paint their hair red if they couldn't do it within a month. Uh, and we found uh, through, this was all just, just us playing jokes on people, but we found that that's actually a very useful question to weed out people that can't deal with the weirdness of, of, of the company as it was at that time. Um, we had uh, uh, salespeople from Cisco uh, se secretly changing into jeans when they, got, when they were in their car <laughs> so they uh, uh, would not upset us with their suits and ties. In, 2000, in 2005, uh, or in 1995, 2005, in 1995, uh, uh, we were uh, at the forefront of one of the, uh, one of the defining uh, moments of Dutch internet and, and possibly of the internet as a whole. Uh, when our offices were raided by the Church of Scientology. The Church of Scientology is a very interesting, crazy cult. Uh, they believe in space aliens and, and all sorts of stuff, but they're very, they're very litigious. They like, they like using uh, uh, the process of law to get at their enemies. And they had lots of enemies because they were basically extorting everybody that joined the Church of Scientology for all their money, uh, making them pay for very expensive courses. And somebody had put online all the course materials proving, A, that, that they were paying for ridiculous second-hand science fiction uh, uh, stuff that L. Ron Hubbard, their great church leader, once wrote. Um, so this made the church very angry, and the church had, until then, destroyed all its adversaries. In America, that's a little bit easier to do than in Holland, but also they had lots of money for lawyers, and uh, one of the people on, uh, uh, on Access for All had put these materials on his website. And we made the defense, which is now very common, we said, look, this is not our website, it's this person's website. And you have to talk to this person, we're just the carrier. Um, and uh, uh, Scientology pushed for the courts, but they were, there was a raid, there was people searching the offices, there was even American cult members in our offices because it was a civil raid, which I didn't even know was possible. Um, the company grew and grew and grew. Uh, uh, as more and more people got on the internet, uh, became a very, very large company. I left in, in 1997, 
uh, because very large companies aren't so much my thing. My, my value to the company was probably when it was below 10 people. My value. Other people, uh, most notably my uh, co-conspirator, Felipe Rodriguez, uh, were much more important in the phase to bring it to 50 people than I was. Um, where is Access for All now? Uh, it's a huge company. It hires over 300 people. This is the corporate headquarters. Uh, much more funny, uh, this building, which is down the street from them, uh, is a building they now use as one of their co-location facilities. It's where I rent a rack. Uh, my new company rents a rack from Access for All in, in this building. Uh, and you can see the big fence in front of it. This is, this is the phone switch that we used to go trashing at when, in the hectic days. This is the fence we used to climb uh, to get to phone company documents in the dumpster. And now, Access for All rents it as, as their colo space. Um, I then went on to form a company called ITSX together with Job de Haas, who's another speaker here. Uh, we did computer security consulting. Uh, uh, I wasn't so much involved in the day-to-day in the -day technical work. Uh, I did publicity and I did uh, uh, company policy a little bit. Um, what I remember from that days uh, from those days, and, and, and I think what's still true, is that computer security business is really strange. Uh, many of you are in it. Computer security business uh, is often sold a little bit uh, in a mafia model. Uh, unscrupulous people will just, if they want to sell their services, uh, uh, they talk to their customers and it's really, the sales rep goes, really nice company you have here, really dependent on IT. Let's hope nothing happens to it. Um, even the good people uh, that want to sell IT services, we, we think of ourselves as, as different than that. We're not the, the, the cheap uh, panic salespeople. We try to educate our customers. We try to tell our customers what's, uh, what the risks are. Um, we tell them uh, the little lock in your browser doesn't mean everything's secure. Uh, Security is, is not a project. You can't just buy something and be secure. It's a process. You have to think about it. No point in having a really heavy steel door if the windows are open. We try to tell our customers all these things. You know, Think about security in, 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 in a, in a grown-up, sort of organized fashion. Uh, and Think about your risks and, and, and what are your threats. Uh, needs to be designed in from the start, this whole security thing. We try. And then we're met invariably by blank stares. Tell me this isn't true. We're met. Uh, and then we try again, and we try again, and every time it's the same blank stares. Like, uh, and at some point, we think, well, somebody, something's got to happen. These people really have a problem. And so what we end up figuring out is what's the, most, what's the least unproductive direction for this person to be running in in blind panic. And then we turn around 180 degrees and paint really big ghosts. Ooh, look at all these scary ghosts over there. And then they run in blind panic exactly in the direction we wanted. And, and we find ourselves sort of maneuvering our customers by sort of changing the directions of the really big ghosts and having them run in blind panic, which isn't the same as, as, as what we set out to do. Uh, that's sort of my, my thoughts on the computer security world. Um, I then, uh, uh, we sold ITSX to another company called Madison Gurkha. Um, went to set up Cryptophone. Cryptophone builds uh, Windows mobile telephones, uh, uh, basically modified HTC phones uh, that come with a, a completely tricked out ROM. Uh, so uh, you can determine how secure you want to be by turning off all sorts of functionality. One of the things we turn off, of course, is over the air uh, uh, updates and all stuff like that. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a telephone that does encrypted voice over the CSD data channel. It's the old uh, GSM data channel. Uh, uses uh, Diffie-Hellman, uses Blowfish, AES-256 uh, to encrypt the, the voice. Uh, we also have public key encrypted SMSs, so using SMS as the transport channel, also for the keys. Uh, anyway, uh, and the source is available, so you can actually look at it. Just uh, something I did. Um, then came 2006. I'm sort of fast forwarding a bit. And in 2006, uh, I got very upset because the city of Amsterdam switched to voting machines. And this is the voting machine they made me use. It's called the SDU New Vote. And the SDU New Vote 
um, is actually an embedded Windows machine. It's embedded Windows uh, uh, running on a machine that has a, a built-in GPRS modem. And I had written, I had, I had read the legislation uh, concerning this machine, and the legislation in the, for this machine said absolutely nothing about the machine being unmanipulable or secure. It just said that it had to be able to withstand moisture. It had to be vibration proof. Uh, uh, the electrical characteristics, it, it shouldn't shock anybody, but there was nothing about computer security. And I was really upset. Um, and I wasn't so much upset uh, for the lack of security, because that can be fixed, at least to some extent. I was upset for the lack of transparency. If, uh, uh, if you have elections and you have a ballot box, and if you, if you propose to replace that ballot box uh, by a new mechanism where the ballot box is still there, but then the, uh, in the evening when the polls close, a company picks up all the ballot boxes, takes them to their company headquarters, and then using a secret method that we cannot know about, that is trade secret, uh, uh, well protected, they count the ballots and they come out a little later, very, very soon they come out with a, with a note that has the results. Everybody would realize, if this was a paper ballot system, everybody would realize that's completely unacceptable for an election. There's, the whole point of an election is that it's observable. Uh, yet, with computers, if you sprinkle the magic dust of, uh, oh, it's a computer, it's modern, uh, it has cryptography, that's, that's even, even more powerful fairy dust. Uh, if you sprinkle the fairy dust, then all of a sudden the problem of transparency was meant to go away. Um, in fact, I got so upset that we, we decided that, uh, there's not just me, a bunch of friends, we decided that this was the one and only time that we were gonna be voting on computers, no matter what it took. We were very, very angry. Um, so I spent three years of my life, basically until last year, uh, getting rid of voting machines. Most of my country, uh, this, was, this is the machine that had like uh, seven or eight percent of the market. The other 90% of the market, because all of Holland, we were the last city to switch, all of Holland was using electronic voting, and the rest of the country was using an older machine. This is the NEDAP ES3B, uh, which is a, a 68,000 system uh, with a, a 4x40 uh, uh, LCD display and very large foil keyboard. It's only using a fraction of the keys that, that are below there uh, are actually mapped for this small election that we set up. Um, as you can see, it's standing uh, on a table in somebody's house. That's actually my office. Uh, and it's my table, and it shouldn't be there. Um, we, of course, claimed that these computers were insecure and that the transparency was lost. And we quickly discovered that nobody really understood the transparency argument, which is really, really scary if you think about it. Nobody really understood the transparency argument, but the security argument was really, really important for people. We felt that we should win on the transparency argument. This can be won just by explaining that this is wrong. No, you can't win something by explaining this is wrong. You need to show that it's insecure. Why? So computer security is a sexy subject. The media likes it. People want to read about it. It's an insatiable, there's an insatiable demand for stories about computer security. And Wau Holland, one of the founders of the CCC, the Chaos Computer Club in Germany, had already told me in, in, in the 80s that you can use that media attention to wrap political messages that are about something completely different. You can wrap messages about privacy, which is something I've been doing for 20 years. You can wrap messages about anything else in stories about computer security. Slip the message sort of, sort of in, the, in another story, um, which is, I think, what a lot of hackers uh, have resorted to over the past 20 years. So anyway, we, were, we found that we couldn't win on, on the transparency argument, and we had to go for the, for the security uh, problem. Of course, we didn't have any of the voting machines to prove that they were insecure in the manufacturer. We made the argument, look, this is a computer. It can count the votes honestly. Surely it can. But it's just, it just as easily can count the votes dishonestly, or it can be used to play chess against. And uh, the manufacturer did something really stupid. He said, uh, 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 chess? No, no, no. Our machines can't play chess, really. They're single-purpose, dedicated machines. They can't play chess. Um, we started a major project to find out, there's 500 municipalities in Holland, and we found out which ones had recently merged or had something else happen to their structure, so they might have surplus voting machines. And we called all of them. 
there's like 50, 50 municipalities we called, uh, saying that we were a, a company that had their own elections and we wanted this machine because this ballot stuff was all too complicated. And of course, these municipal people, they, they agree, ballot stuff is all way too complicated, the, the uh, paper stuff, uh, well, yeah. Uh, so we wanted to buy the machine. And one municipality sold us two machines and, uh, uh, and the box to, to, to read the memory modules from them. So we now had the machine. Um, in a process that was a very, very intense five weeks, we completely reverse engineered the machine, uh, uh, so found out everything there was to know about it, wrote an I.O. library for it so we didn't have to use any of their code, uh, programmed, uh, uh, took a chess program, uh, Tom Garrigan's tiny chess, uh, 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 and modified it so it would run in four kilobytes of RAM, which is really, really little for chess, uh, modified it so it, was, it became an even lousier chess player. But you could play against it uh, so that we could show, we actually used, I don't have that picture here, but we actually used that board as the chess board. So you could press the button underneath the right chess fields to move your piece. So we made it a little bit fancier than en entering the, the move. Uh, so it would also look good in the press. Uh, and we also programmed it so that it would count dishonestly but it would only do so if it was a real election, if it lasted long enough, if there was enough votes cast. It would steal proportionally from all the other parties a given percentage and give it to one party, but it would never steal a party's only vote so that if you voted for something and, and you were the only one, you would still see your vote. So it was fairly smart about stealing the votes. And we demonstrated both things at a press conference five weeks later, a month before the elections. Uh, which got a really a lot of press attention. Uh, it got government commissions appointed, uh, to find out how we'd gotten into this mess. Uh, uh, it, it got the realization across that we needed to get rid of these machines. Um, there's, I could talk for two hours about this whole uh, uh, electronic voting movement, which I won't. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, it's a really big movement. It's worldwide. Uh, it's very necessary because the movement to, to make elections intransparent is all over the world. Governments want to introduce electronic voting. And there's a very easy, easy reason why they want to introduce electronic voting. It's the easiest and, and policy cheapest way to be seen as modern for a government. If you, in any other kind of e-democracy, any kind of, of, of involves empowering people, it involves sharing information, it involves uh, interacting with people in a different way, speeding up processes, it involves things which are very painful for governments, changing processes, renegotiating things with stakeholders. Electronic voting is the government's dream. So, uh, and it needs, to be, it needs to be fought wherever possible because it always involves a loss of transparency. Even if it has a paper trail, even if it has, it's always, yes, we can use the paper trail to verify if something goes wrong, but you never know if something goes wrong. You can get 5% extra votes in, in most elections, or even 10% extra votes, and, and nobody would ever be the wiser. It's putting centralized control uh, where you had a decentralized system. In, it, in Holland, we have, we're a country of 16 million. Uh, 40,000 people count the votes. Those 40,000 people publish their results. Uh, they, 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 they have public sessions, they publish their results, and then the results permeate up to make the, the national result. That's a pyramid of trust that works from the bottom up. If you have 100 people, you can make, take a statistical sample of your own elections, monitor 100 polling stations, and if there is going to be a fraud, either that fraud is to be carried out before your very own eyes, or these 100 stations are going to have a very different result from the rest of the country. That's, powerful. That's a powerful tool for auditing your election, for seeing if people are still honest. It's very important. Um, Holland also had internet voting for different elections, smaller elections. Um, this is the uh, management interface to that internet voting system. Uh, with this interface, you could log in, uh, 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 stop the election, start the election, upload a new electorate, uh, do all sorts of really, really unwanted things. Um, okay, which brings me to the role of hackers in the world, politics. Um, 
Let's analyze the world of today for a moment. Uh, the Chinese have a curse that says, may you live in interesting times. Uh, and I think we are looking at interesting times ahead. Um, the next few decades are going to be very interesting. We're approaching the end of the oil age uh, without too much hope for a soft landing. In many areas will be facing resource problems of some kind. Um, atmospheric CO2, sea level, both exceeding uh, what used to be the worst case in the 2004 IPCC reports. Uh, so there's major climate impact. Uh, and as far as climate change is concerned, uh, people in the tropics carry the brunt of that in terms of impact. Um, simply put, uh, worldwide it looks as if the party's over. It looks as if this, this couple of hundred years of, 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 of rapid and unchecked growth are over. And, and the world is going to have to readjust at the very least. Uh, things are going to be changing, dynamic, and, and at least more chaotic than they are today. Um, something else about today's world is unprecedented. Uh, governments of anything larger than a small village have never before in human history had the ability to acquire and process in real time data about where everyone is and what they're doing. That's never existed. That ability has never before existed. Um, Couple these two developments to, devo to these two developments to the deployment pretty much anywhere on the planet of laws and regu regulations to tear down walls between information that government has and to tear down restrictions on government power in the name of terrorism, in the name of whatever. Um, I'm from a European country that has a long and democratic tradition, so having governments with pretty much unchecked power is much more normal to many of you than it is to me. But things will change and things will become more chaotic. Um, the hacker community has always known about the dangers of this. We've known the word SIGINT. We understand data mining, at least from sort of a, 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 a theoretical standpoint. Uh, we know about the cost of a petabyte. Uh, and we know how much you can store in a petabyte. Uh, we know full well that at the present rate, 10 or 20 years from now, there will be very, very literally no place to hide. Um, many hackers, including myself, have made a point of telling others about these dangers. And then we went on to demonstrate how clever we were. We broke into systems that were said to be unbreakable. And we generally showed that the emperor was not wearing any clothes, uh, which I'm not knocking. This is a good thing to do. It creates better systems. It's useful in and by itself. The information world could not exist without the role of hackers showing that things were insecure. Um, but back to what happens if governments really turn bad on us, the totalitarian state. Um, World War II is recent enough in, in European and, and world consciousness. Uh, in the, our collective consciousness has sort of a concept of what, what evil totalitarianism means. Um, most people have thought about it. And they've thought about what they would do if, if, if the regime would ever to be to turn murderous and crazy and completely out of control. Uh, most people like to think of themselves as resistance heroes. I'm going to be saving lives, destroying the dictatorship in the end. In reality, most people continue living their lives and they just move forward the point where they take action, a little bit at a time. So like, yeah, but it's not as bad as, and it's not, they'll just move forward this point. Um, Fortunately, resistance movements of any kind don't need that many people. They don't need to be very large to be effective. Um, resistance, if you think about it from a very abstract point of view, is about logistics. It's about discussing strategy with like-minded people, spreading opinion and facts, uh, moving around money or supplies for refugees, fighters, whatnot, uh, planning and executing clandestine operations, organizing armed resistance, just to name a few things. This is, this is what everybody has thought about, at least theoretically, for when the situation really turns totalitarian. Um, if you can't do that without being seen, there's no point in resisting. And most people realize that they can be seen. Most people realize that, that, that the structures that have been built do not allow for the type of resistance that used to be. Um, so, how do people reconcile, reconcile this with this resistance hero image that they have in their mind of what they're going to do if, if the situation turns sour? What they've done is they've incorporated us into that vision. We, the hacker community, have a role in that vision as the hackers will simply turn that all off. 
uh, we'll just insert a virus, we'll just uh, uh, corrupt the databases, uh, press the delete key, logging in through all sorts of crazy 3D graphics interfaces with skulls and, and, and gates going up and then uh, uh, eventually we'll get in and we'll destroy the databases and then, and then everything else can proceed as normal. Um, and this is really something to think about. Um, people do not take our warning seriously because of us. That's a really, a really strange thing to realize. Um, we've become part of the resistance plot in their mind. So while they're rescuing the pretty lady, uh, the hackers take out the computers. We point out the danger, uh, but we haven't really pointed out that when this technology is all deployed and come 10, 20 years from now, our hands are tied. Governments are going to have this, pretty much the same capabilities of defense as we have of offense. There, there's going to be more people working for them than there's going to be work, people working for, quote, the resistance, whatever that's called. Um, chances of doing anything to disrupt that type of surveillance, at least in my mind, are fairly slim. It's not Hollywood. Shutting down a government's ability to see everything if such a government becomes evil is simply not a promise on which we can deliver. We're not the modern day Robin Hoods. We cannot take out the Sheriff of Nottingham. And we've let people believe that we can. Um, this is sort of a thought that I want to leave you with, uh, to ponder on, to think about, and maybe to discuss if there's still time. I don't know how much time do I have. There's still a little bit of time. Uh, to maybe discuss a little bit, uh, because I think it's a really, it's a really interesting point. All right, that was sort of my presentation for today. Oh. Any questions, remarks, crazy stuff? No questions. All right, then that's it. I'll uh, see you later.